Okay, so in the decade preceding the pandemic, the EU's economic governance suffered from a crisis of legitimacy in terms of governance procedures, economic performance, and political responsiveness. This I talk about in my book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone Crisis. And what I argue there and what I see as the major internal problem for the EU has been a Eurozone crisis governance, which involved governing by rules and ruling by numbers with the wrong rules and numbers which didn't work and these were based on ordo liberal ideas about macroeconomic stability, the dangers of deficits and debt, the benefits of austerity, ignoring needs for investment and growth. Also based on neoliberal ideas about the need for ever freer markets and less and less state, the glories of competitiveness and labor market flexibility, ignoring increasing social precariousness and insecurity. So the economic results were too little investment, low growth, leading to continued macroeconomic divergences among countries, rising poverty, rising inequality, social inequality, and politically, of course, what did we see? Citizen discontent, popular revolt with the decline of mainstream parties and the rise of populist anti-system extremes. Now, the good news is that, well, COVID-19, you can't really call that good news, except for the fact that it reversed the economics of austerity with the rules and numbers suspended, a recognition of the need for new ideas about to ha how to deal with the, econo the European economy under challenge. And this is not just, of course, about health and economic disasters, but also climate change. And so what we saw is the new next generation EU with the temporary resilience and recovery fund that took the European economic governance beyond the old ideas, proposing an enhanced role for the state as entrepreneur to promote growth, provide investments to meet challenges, you know, including green transition, digital transformation, um, while also seeking to repair the damages wrought by both Eurozone crisis management and unmanaged globalization. So the push toward greater social equity with more democracy. If I've got one more uh, 30 seconds, the problem, the problem is that the fund is temporary. Arguably, it won't be enough to jumpstart European economies, but even if it does, what we need is permanent EU level debt beyond the temporary pandemic investment bonds. So think of such permanent debt as sovereign wealth funds for all the member states to invest as grants uh, in education, training, income, to income support, as well as investment in greening the economy and digitally connecting people. Um, but to make this work beyond this, and given what I said about the crisis of legitimacy regarding democracy, one needs to de decentralize and democratize the deployment of such uh, grants to make it much more bottom up in terms of the European semester. And that means not only from the member states for the EU, but within the member states from municipalities and regions to the member state level that then goes to the EU level. And it seems to me that only in this way can we be certain that growth will reach the people most in need, will energize civil society while combating also arguably violations of the rule of law thereby improving legitimacy overall, economic, social, and political. Okay, so this, of course, is the main question of the moment. Everyone's been talking about it. It's the big buzz since um, uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said that we are a geopolitical commission. So ideally, it means that the EU becomes more of an actor on the world stage, developing strategic autonomy to influence the world and to support not just its own interests, but the norms it holds dear. The problem is that it lacks the capacity to do this in a range of areas. I and mean, if we think military power, there's been lots of talk about common security and defense policy, CSDP, and now a defense union, but all serious operations are still under the NATO flag there's still a huge question about the division of labor between NATO and the EU and how to achieve security autonomy. You know, the answer to this uh, conundrum lies in how the future relationship between the EU and NATO develops. Um, Jolly and Howarth has suggested that it might be through a merging of NATO and the EU with the EU slowly taking over. 
uh, and a transfer of responsibility from the American to European leadership within the alliance. We can hope for that, but that's going to still take a very long time to, to come. And in the, in, the, in the interim, institutional coherence is also a problem. You know, how does the EU speak in one voice in foreign policy? The EU has been very fragmented in terms of its foreign policy maker making. EU member states can't agree on a common line on any of the superpowers, or we're talking, whether we're talking about China, Russia, or even in the US. The high representative does his best, but he has very limited powers and is dependent for those powers he has on the goodwill and support of the member states. Beyond this, it's still, I mean, all of this is a problem given the member states holding to their own views, often or generally jealously guarding the prerogatives that they still have, and often focused on questions of sovereignty. So in, in another area, in international trade, it's easier because the, the trade representative, but he, even here we can talk about problems with ratification. Think of Canada, the you know Canadian, um, is CETA, the trade deal, that was held up uh, in one small, uh, you know, part of, of, of Belgium by one, you know, regional actor. So beyond this, of course, there are many other challenges. The EU is, after all, in a very bad neighborhood. The U.S. has many fewer such problems. And of course, it's currently unable to stabilize its own neighborhood which of course brings us back to the question of strategic autonomy. You know, the EU has traditionally presented itself as a normative power, but this is ne has never been enough. When this comes back to the extent to which and the way in which the EU can or cannot use military power as an additional leverage. You know, and here, if we talk about the kinds of issues confronting the EU, just you know, a quick list, dealing with the migration crisis and the issue of Turkey, highly problematic here, um, especially since climate specialists increase, are increasingly convinced that migratory flows will be the biggest destabilizing consequence of climate change. Then we can talk about, EU talks a good game about nor its normative power, but what do you do about human rights in China, especially in terms of the Uyghurs? What about Russia and human rights, especially in terms of the detention of Navalny? Beyond this, energy, Russia and Nord Stream 2. And think about what the U.S. has been pressing uh, Europe to abandon Nord Stream 2. I doubt that Germany is going to be happy about that or willing to do it. And of course, there's also the question of the EU as a beacon for democracy. You know, it's highly problematic when it has its own rule of law issues internally. And here, of course, I'm talking about Hungary and Poland and their illiberal drift. So, Essentially, to sum up, the EU faces challenges as a, ge as a geopolitical actor, even with its own, within its own region, let alone in the larger world. So here I'm going to talk about globalization, which is not what one would normally think of when we think of international concerns, but actually it's probably a primary concern, not only for the rest of the world, but also for the EU. And part of the problem with globalization is it has gone too far. It has left the EU vulnerable in particular, as we saw with the pandemic, to breakdowns in global supply chains when it needs them the most, digital platforms that control content and avoid taxes, deindustrialization in Europe. So what the EU needs to do in terms of the international, but also the European order, is to try to push for more managed globalization. Global value chains need to continue, of course, but at the same time, Europe's needs to create EU and national supply chains. There needs to be an insuring of a certain portion of manufacturing capability. And of course, a rise in the level playing field in terms of what member states can invest uh, and how one incentivizes investment. You know, the EU needs to think global to promote European champions uh, and local to perfect, protect infant industries where they're not a danger to the single market. And as part of this, we need to think about state aid and how to revise the, the rules to allow more state aid, in particular with regard to growth, 
generally speaking, but also especially greening the economy, digitalizing uh, communities, um, and then also in terms of industrial policy, or should I call it industrial strategy, um, since industrial policy tends to be a bit of a difficult world for pe word for people still but but you know what about research and development consortia more state money in public and private consortia and the, and, and the like we can go on to issues of taxation you know what's interesting to see is that there has been an initiative coming from the u.s janet yellen leading it engaging with the oecd in terms of harmonizing corporate ta taxation and getting rid of kinds of distort distortive practices and tax evasion. But, you know, the EU itself needs to abolish its own tax havens. It needs to tax corporations at the same rate across the EU. You know, all of this is necessary to bring back taxes on profits, bring them back to the EU and the member states. And, of course, this links us back to issues of democracy and the reasons for the rise of populist anti-system parties. I Man, didn't need to go into this, but, you know, let's think about the sources of populism, the socioeconomics of people feeling left behind as a result of offshoring of manufacturing jobs, leaving people in poorer paid service jobs. There's also the socio-cultural concerns about loss of social status, and as a result, the focus on migration as a cause with nationalist populists scapegoating migrants and championing welfare chauvinism. And then, of course, there's the politics of take, take back control, of which Brexit is the best example. So rethinking globalization also means rethinking democracy, ensuring that developing economies can turn to continue to develop naturally in a climate-friendly way, but also that EU economies are better developed through managed globalization, with better jobs through greening the economy, with more connected societies through digitalizing communities, and with a lessening of inequalities. So again, it's basically, we can't just do the political economy, we also need to do society and democracy. In the book, I argue that Europe's crisis of legitimacy is not just about the economics or the politics, it's about democracy and it's about legitimacy. So how do we think about legitimacy? Legitimacy is not just about governing authority, which is about trust in government, public consent, but it's also about governing activities. And for these activities, one needs to think about not just economic performance, um, but also, um, procedural quality and naturally political legitimacy, political responsiveness. And the problem for the EU is although it's been building, it's, it's built up its authority over the years um, and, and in policy area after policy area. So there's been a certain amount of trust in, um, in the authority of the EU and we've seen it, it's been tacit in terms of citizen consent as member states agreed to the EU's expansion in one policy after another, you know, just think about international trade and, and that's really something at the EU level, but also the ECJ, the Court of Justice and decision making primacy of e uh, and supremacy of EU law, many areas. But the problem for the EU has been the Eurozone crisis and actually not just the Eurozone crisis, but our, the past decade, the long decade of crises. And in that context, um, the problem has been e the EU's governing activities, because another aspect of legitimacy is not just um, is not just governing authority; it's governing activities. It's as I mentioned before; it's per it's performance, procedures, and politics. And here, what we saw is a massive breakdown. What happened is kind of stylize this. What happened is the EU actors thought all they had to do was focus on the procedures double down on the rules, governing by rules and ruling by numbers, and then everything would be fine because there'd be good performance. And therefore, um, it didn't matter that they hadn't consulted the people. No, no political responsiveness. And of course, what we see is that this was highly problematic because as I mentioned in my earlier um, comments, 
um, the performance was a disaster. The rules didn't work. The sort of the focus on austerity and structural reform, um, fast, you know, deficit reduction, fiscal consolidation, with structural reforms that involved mainly crush the unions uh, and cut the welfare state, in particular in Southern Europe, was a total disaster. You know, the sort of the 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 worst happened in the program countries in Southern Europe. Uh, but also Ireland, uh, and and there, what you saw is 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 a sort of a loss of trust in Europe, loss of the EU's governing authority, and not just in terms of people's perceptions of its governing activities, because none of that worked. Southern European countries were much much worse off as a result, and we saw it in terms of the pandemic. You know, Southern European countries in particular didn't have the hospital beds; they had cut; they hadn't invested. You know, you can go on and on and on in terms of the, you know, high unemployment, youth unemployment, a massive problem, brain drain because people moved north, those who could, um, and very, very low growth in those countries. There are other area, other reasons for that, but in any case, massive crisis of legitimacy. What we can say, though, is that with the pandemic, the emergency politics of, of the crisis um, was essentially rolled back, uh, suggesting that there's, there's a clear sense that that kind of policy didn't work. With the pan pandemic instead, what you saw is a massive increase um, in, in spending. Member states suspended uh, the rules and just started spending to save jobs and so you no know, deficit and debt rules of the stability and growth pack out the window. And the commission agrees to that, you know, invokes the escape clause, et cetera. The ECB, the European Central Bank, that had slowly actually been ratcheting up uh, what it was doing in terms of um, monetary transactions, you know, which starts very, very slowly, arguably too slowly for the Eurozone um, crisis, but increases, you know, after Mar Mario Draghi's will do whatever it takes to save the euro in July 2012, you end up with um, quantitative easing in 2015. And in the, uh, in the pandemic, we get a new um, pandemic emergency purchasing program that gets rid of even the limitations on bond buying that there had been before and necessarily so, again, to save the euro. I think all of this is tremendously important to, to, to understand what was going on. Also importantly, if we just look at the European semester, uh, at the height of the crisis, 2010 to 2012, 13, what you saw was a um, kind of draconian kind of European semester in which Fiscal consolidation was the headline goal. Everyone was told, tighten your belts. And those countries that had the, in trouble, structural reform. Um, and, and, and it looked, it wasn't quite this, but it looked highly top down, highly anti-democratic. And certainly in the program countries, it was not at all democratic. What we see is a major shift also in the European semester where now it's focused on next generation EU and all countries are told, now you need to think, you know, forget about the limits on spending, spend where it's most necessary to green the economy, to digitalize uh, society, to, um, to focus on inequalities, which also means spend more on education, training, et cetera. And the process itself is no longer top down, but it's much more bottom up, not entirely, but much more bottom up because every member state has to create its own national um, resilience and recovery plans. And that is in fact uh, bottom up. And then of course the Euro European Commission will have to respond to that, but, but it's a far cry from what it was before. I think. The one limitation here is that, especially in the, in the rush to try to get this done, in most countries, this has been most member states, this has been a pretty nationally centralized process. Ideally, what one would do is decentralize and democratize it. 
make it much, much more bottom up. In other words, again, similar to what I said before, but what one would need to do as this process continues is to get member states to decentralize to the local levels and democratize, bring in the social partners and civil society to talk about what would be most appropriate and uh, make it, you know, take it down to the regions and the municipalities. Try to get, you know, try to use this as a way of revitalizing citizens' connections <laughs> to one another, but also to the EU. This is a massive amount of money, especially and hopefully if there were to be a permanent fund, investment fund, which I mentioned earlier, you know, as we think about as sovereign, uh, sovereign wealth funds to invest in the future. So I haven't answered the second part of your question, which is on the future of Europe and then the convention on the future in Europe. And there, it really becomes a question of what does it do? You know, does it focus on institutions? Does it focus on policies? One of the things, if we start with policies, in particular in terms of economic governance, one of the problems for economic governance, in particular with regard to, um, to the euro and eurozone governance, is that the rules have only been suspended. They have not been reformed. They haven't been gotten rid of. And that means that legally speaking, throughout the treaties and the, um, and the texts, uh, you've got these rules and numbers written all over the place. All we need two to three years down the, long, down the road is the frugal four plus, and I think Austria is part of this frugal four, um, to say, hey, wait a minute, that is bad. You know, and therefore everyone needs to start tightening again. That would be a total disaster, in particular for Southern European countries, in particular for Italy. What one needs is more flexibility in the rules. If we can't get rid of the rules entirely, and I would argue get rid of them, you don't need them anymore. The fear of moral hazard that was such a big fear for so long, it's gone because everyone knows that if you get in trouble, if you go bankrupt, if you overspend, you get sent to the, you know, the European stability mechanism, the ESM, which no one wants. There's conditionality there, you know, it's all there. So I, I, you know, I don't think we need to worry about that, just as in the US, no one worries about states going bankrupt because they know what will happen. They'll go into receivership, et cetera. So with the EU. Plus, we're in a different world now. I mean, thank goodness. I mean, there needs to be a rethinking of the ideas behind economic governance. I said this earlier too, you know, ordo-liberal stability rules, neoliberal structural reform rules don't work. So for the future of Europe, one needs to, you know, on the policies in terms of economic governance, at the least, if it's possible, you need to, the treaties need to be reformed to get rid of the numbers and to rethink arguably the rules, if not get rid of them altogether. Now I know that that won't be, you know, so use them as standards. Olivier Blanchard talks about changing from, you know, strict numbers, numbers and rules to standards or guidelines. Um, it's not clear that even that is possible, but at least then take the rules as much, much more flexible. But, you know, ideally use the treaties to get rid of it, get rid of the bailout clause, get rid of all of these things that are written into the rules that are baked into the rules, but need to get, be gotten rid of. But that's not enough. For this convention on the future of Europe, we need to rethink democracy in Europe. We need to rethink the institutional rules as, as, as well. The unanimity rule, everyone knows, does not work. It's a total disaster. One needs to go to super majorities and opt-outs at the very least. Plus, um, most treaties should be turned into ordinary legislation, which can be done with a passerelle clause. And to turn them into or ordinary legislation doesn't necessarily mean you get rid of them, but at least they can become the subject of debate and change. They can be part of the co-decision method where the European Parliament is part of the discussion 
And you know, what is democracy but deliberation and contestation? One needs much more of that and much more of it around the treaties and, and, and legislation rather than treating them as sort of the holy grail or no, the holy ghost, no, none of that. Just, you know, golden rules that are not very golden, you know. Um, one needs to essentially rethink the institutional aspects of this and, of course, bring, the, bring people back in. That means, for the most part, the European Parliament needs to be brought into your Eurozone governance because it's really not there. It was not thought of at the beginning. With these pandemic funds, with the Resilience and Recovery Fund, this is redistributive. You know, no taxation without representation. The European Parliament needs to be there in a much bigger way. Um, and then finally, there needs to be more ways in which, and that's for the Convention on the Future of Europe, to find ways to bring the people into all of these discussions. So whether it means national parliaments involved with the European Parliament, whether it means new kinds of deliberative forums to bring people in, not sure. It also means at the national level, to do more to bring people into national decision making because as as it is in particular with eurozone governance and with pandemic governance national parliaments have become rubber stamps to decisions taking the eu level in the midst of a pandemic okay i understand it <laughs> but as we go to greater normality national parliaments need to be involved in a much greater way in all of these decisions and they need to figure out ways to bring citizens into discussions that then go up to the EU level as well.